the light is on, so I should be getting sound. Otherwise, I will have failed already. Okay, let's open in our prayer books to page 290, page 290. And what this is, is the second office of instruction. So in our prayer book, what we have is uh, two offices of instruction. They're basically taking the catechism and um, rolling it into two different kind of liturgical contexts. But I want to start this week with the very beginning of the second office. I think it's really, really good. So you'll see where it says minister and people. That's the, the typical call and response in our liturgy. So we'll start there. Come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. Show thy servants thy work. Oh man, you're going to have to do better than that. Let's try that one more time. Show thy servants thy work. Let thy merciful kindness, O Lord, be upon us. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. Lord, hear our prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Almighty God, who has built thy church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the head cornerstone, Grant us so to be joined together in the unity of spirit by their doctrine, that we may be made an holy temple acceptable unto thee, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah, so um, the, what we're going to be doing in this class is looking at uh, what sometimes we call a rule of life. What is a rule of life, and why should you want one? You're like, I don't know if I want one of those. That sounds, that sounds hardcore. I don't know. Well, basically, all this, is, all, all this is is a tool for practicing the spiritual disciplines um, individually. I mean, we want to do those disciplines as individuals. But in our context, more importantly, it's going to be communally. That's really where the, the Anglican tradition um, shines is having this communal approach to the spiritual disciplines. Um, what are the spiritual disciplines? Like anybody, anybody can name off a spiritual discipline or some spiritual disciplines. When you hear that term, what, 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 what is that? Prayer. prayer. We got prayer. Anything else? Fasting. Fasting. <laughs> Studying the scripture. Prayer, fasting, Bible reading, or studying. Yep, those are usually the top ones that everybody, everybody gets. Any, anything, anything else that you can think of? Coming to church. Okay, going to public worship. Yeah, coming to church. That's a good spiritual discipline. And, and anything else? Maybe something we do at about the half, uh, half time point at church? Communion? Well, the, the sacraments, you can't put there. But yeah, I was thinking giving. Yeah, giving, you know, gen, um, giving or, or that, that sort of thing, whether it's offering or whatever. Um, praise yeah, pr praise and worship, study, meditation. You, if you just Google a um, list of the spiritual disciplines, you'll find like nobody's list is the same, but they all include things like that. Uh, so in Acts 2, we have kind of the, the germ of the spiritual disciplines as we understand it, the germ of rule of life. And so this is after everybody, we have these 3,000 men um, come to faith and everybody gets baptized. Do you think our services are long? Wait till you have a 3,000 person baptism. That's a long service. Um, and this is, this is the way this passage concludes. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in the prayers. You'll notice I have in the quote, the word the, that definite article is in brackets. It is there in the Greek, um, the prayers. Um, that, is, that is the way it is in the Greek. Um, for some reason, a lot of English translations don't like it there. Um, but it's, it's usually, the reason why we point that out is that especially in that context of these, these Jewish men and women, what, they're not just thinking, okay, I'm gonna go have extemporaneous prayers. They're thinking the prayers, they have a liturgy. You know, so there is something liturgical implied from the very beginning. Um, and you'll see that um, when Peter gets his vision about the, uh, the animals, um, you know, kill, kill and eat, you know, God basically giving him a, a hint at the Gentiles are going to come to faith. 
he's up there at the hour of prayer. He's basically doing his early evening prayers that everybody, every good Jew would do at that time. So that, that set prayer tradition is very big in the church, and it always has been. That doesn't mean that's the only way we do prayer, but that is kind of the way that the community does prayer. So we have, okay, we have the prayers. Well, let's work it backwards. So implying a liturgy, uh, breaking of the bread. What's that mean? Are they just getting together for dinner? Yeah, it's communion. It, it, that, that's exactly right. Breaking, breaking of bread in this context does in, indeed imply communion. Um, doctrine and fellowship. So they're learning the teachings of the, of the apostles as a community. They're studying together. They're hearing together. They're being preached at, studying the scriptures together. Our bishop in um, kind of a, a bit of a catechism, uh, very much a modern language version of what we have in our offices of instruction, he um, threw a question at the end of there, kind of an, an addition to what we have in the, in the uh, office of instruction. And um, in there he puts this, he says, every Christian man or woman should from time to time frame for himself a rule of life in accordance with the precepts of the gospel and the faith and order of the church wherein he may consider the following. So here is our bishop's kind of criteria of like a personal rule of life. Um, one, the regularity of his attendance at public worship and especially at the Holy Communion. So there we have the breaking of the bread, that fellowship and doctrine, right? Um, number two, the practice of private prayer, Bible reading and self-discipline. Um, that's a big category, self-discipline. <laughs> That can, that, can, uh, that can cover a lot of things. Uh, number three, bringing the teaching and example of Christ into his everyday life. What's he mean by that? Practicing what you hear, right? Putting into practice these things. Um, number, f- whatever number I'm on, uh, five. The four, am I on four? Okay. Four, the boldness, m- minor dashes in my notes, not numbers. I should have done it by dashes. Uh, but point four, the boldness of his spoken witness to his faith in Christ. Um, Are you actually talking about the faith with other people? Um, Number five, his personal service to the church and community. Number six, the offering of money according to his means for the support of the work of the church at home and overseas. And in our offices of instruction, we kind of have another example of a very basic rule of life. Um, On page 291, so uh, let's turn back to where we just were page 291, about halfway down the page. There's this question, what is your bounden duty as a member of the church? And the answer that we give is my bounden duty is to follow Christ, to worship God every Sunday in his church, and to work and pray and give for the spread of his kingdom. So very much that same kind of thing that the bishop said, although in a, in a bit more uh, kind of big picture thing. Um, and then the catechism goes on to say um, in our offices of instruction that confirmation, some of y'all are preparing to be confirmed or to receive, uh, confirmation is there to help you fulfill that bounden duty. It's, it's something that the church has given us to enable us on the, on the spiritual level to do what we're supposed to do. So the prayer book... Um, now, I, I would say that the Book of Common Prayer is kind of the most important thing that the Anglican tradition has given to the wider church. A lot of folks copy us in one way or the other. Um, you know, for example, uh, any of y'all like Tim Keller out there who just, uh, a blessed memory, he just passed away. Tim, Tim Keller wrote a book on the Psalms and he kind of... Par- parenthetically says, yeah, the Anglicans, their 30-day psalm cycle is a really good thing. I'm like, yes, that's, that's exactly right. It is a good thing. Um, my Presbyterian friend there. Um, and, you know, and, and the, 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 everybody in English borrows from us. The, the wedding service that we all know from TV, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today, all that sort of thing, that's ours. You know, it's, it's, it's influenced the English language and the way that English people look at, at, at religion um, big time. But the prayer book is really designed to set up a communal rule of life for us. That's what it's here for. And we're going to get into details on that in coming weeks. But I want to read to you from the preface of the first book of Common Prayer, 1549. Archbishop Cranmer writes this. There was never anything by the wit of man so well devised 
or so sure established, which in continuance of time hath not been corrupted, as among other things it may plainly appear by the common prayers in the church, commonly called divine service. What do you say? As time goes on, we mess things up, right? There's nothing where we haven't messed it up. Nothing stays pure. He says, um, re regarding common prayer, divine service, he says, the first original and ground whereof, if a man would search out by the ancient fathers, so going back into church history, he shall find that the same was not ordained, but of a good purpose and for a great advancement of godliness. For they so ordered the matter that all the whole Bible or the greatest part thereof should be read over once in a year intending thereby that the clergy, and especially such as were ministers of the congregation, should, by often reading and meditation of God's word, be stirred up to godliness themselves, and be more able to exhort others by wholesome doctrine, and to confute them that were adversaries to the truth. And further, that the people, by daily hearing of the holy scriptures read in the church, should continually profit more and more in the knowledge of God, and be the more inflamed with the love of his true religion. So Archbishop Cranmer, um, kind of the architect of our prayer book, the first uh, um, Archbishop post-Reformation, or after the Reformation, um, the last one before the Reformation too, um, Archbishop Cranmer basically said, the way the ancient church did things, the way they set up prayer, public prayer, was for the purpose of getting the scriptures read. That's the main reason why it was there. We pray so that we can hear the Bible. And by hearing the Bible, um, we're going to be edified, we're going to know God better, we're going to be able to, con to, uh, to refute bad doctrine, and we're going to basically be able to, to, to be doing what we're supposed to do as Christians. And then he goes on and um, lists a whole bunch of medieval, med medieval abuses, and then he goes on. These inconveniences, therefore, considered, here is set forth such an order whereby the same shall be redressed. So we're here to fix that problem. We're not going to have all those abuses, we're going to fix things. And for, for a readiness in this matter, here is drawn out a calendar for that purpose, which is plain and easy to, to, under, to be understood, wherein so much as may be the reading of Holy Scripture so set forth that all things shall be done in order without breaking one piece thereof from another. For this cause be cut off anthems, responses, inviatories, and such like things, as did, as did break the continual course of the reading of the Scripture. So he's saying, what we're going to do in the Book of Common Prayer is give you a Bible reading plan according to the calendar. And we're not going to break it up with a lot of extra stuff because when you break it up, you lose the train of thought. And it's more important to keep the train of thought of the Bible going than it is to have all those other things, no matter how beautiful they are. And he says this, Yet because there is no remedy, but that of necessity must be some rules, therefore certain rules are here set forth, which, as they be few in number, so they be plain and easy to be understood, so that here you have an order for prayer as touching the reading of the Holy Scriptures, much agreeable to the mind and purpose of the old fathers, and a great deal more profitable and commodious than that which as of late was used. So he's saying the main thing we want to reform when it comes to prayer is we want to get you the Bible, and there's going to be a few rules, but they're going to be the kind of thing you can understand. This is not supposed to be something so difficult that you've got to be a professional religious person to understand. This should be something that anybody who can read can figure out. And that, he says, that's going to be a lot more profitable than that which was used. So here's what we see in the prayer book. First of all, we've got the reading of the scripture. That's the first big part of our rule of life in the prayer book. Um, the idea was most of the Bible, it should be easy to follow. It should be relatively systematic without too many breaks or interruptions. Um, little parenthetically, Unfortunately, the revision we have in our prayer book did not do this very well. It did this very poorly. Um, in its desire to make things conform to the church year and the shortening of people's attention spans by the time we get to the 1940s, um, they made a pig's ear of the lectionary. Um, we're going to be changing that um, starting in January here in the parish. Um, I will be giving you guys in this class kind of a heads up of, of what we'll be doing instead of the one that's printed in the front of our book. Um, okay, number two, common prayer. What's common mean in this context? Is it just ordinary stuff? Together. together, yeah. Yeah, it's the prayers that we do together. We pray together as a congregation. We pray together as a, as a parish family. In here are the prayers that we do as a community. 
Um, number three, the sacraments. Um, in the context of the prayer book, when we say the sacraments, we're <coughs> excuse me, specifically speaking of the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion. And the reason for that is that, as our, as our catechism tells us, um, Holy Communion and Baptism, I think I said Lord's Supper and Holy Communion earlier, Holy Communion and Baptism, those are the two. Um, our catechism tells us that they are first, they're ordained by Jesus, they're the ones that Jesus told us to do, very specifically. And number two, that they're generally necessary for salvation. In general, these are the things you really need to have under your belt as a Christian. Um, other, otherwise, be, because this is one of the ways the grace of the sacraments is the things related to our salvation. And we'll talk about that as we, we continue through. And then number four, um, for other growth in our spiritual life. So the other, the other rites, the things that once upon a time before the Reformation were insisted upon as being sacraments. Some people today want to include them in the number. That's okay if they do, no big deal. But they're largely based on our life stages. They're the things that we naturally are going to get to as we go through life as a Christian. So it starts with baptism, but after baptism, we have um, our offices of instruction where we're catechized, and then confirmation, and then marriage, and then sickness and burial. <laughs> um, you know, you know, it's kind of a big skip there. But um, in the meantime, there's all the regular things we do just as people week in and week out. Um, so all of that is in the prayer book. Plus, we have in here the Articles of Religion, which kind of which lay out um, within our tradition kind of the way we understand the basics of Christian doctrine. Um, this is not super difficult stuff. It's pretty basic compared to most of the things coming out at the same time. Um, and also, I would add to this the Book of Homilies, which we don't have in here, um, but um, I can get you all links for copies on that. And these were, were official homilies at the time of the Reformation to help us really understand the basics of, 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 of truth. So that's really where the prayer book and our formularies kind of form, you know, set up our rule of life. Scripture, the prayer we do together, partaking of the sacraments, and all those other areas of growth that we have. Um, I think it's important to point out that this is not, this is not moralism. The point of walking in this rule of life is not to earn brownie points with God. Um, rather, we do this for our growth, not not as a not as a check check you know not to check off the box, not to make God like us better. Um, that's not what this is about. This is not supposed to be a burden. It is a discipline. And any of y'all that have ever um, gone to the gym, you can tell it's been a little bit too long for me. Uh, but uh, those of y'all that regularly, you know, exercise, it's not always fun, but it's always good for you, right? Sometimes you don't want to do it, but at the end you're like, this was good that I did it. That's the way the spiritual disciplines often are. They're, they're like our spiritual exercises. Um, I want to read to you something from a, a, a guy named Alan Jacobs in his, in his Book of Common Prayer a biography. That's, that's a, a, a recent book of his. I, I've, this is the second uh, work of his that I've come across in the last month. I've, I'm really enjoying it. I kind of stumbled across it. But this is, this is from his, the Book of Common Prayer biography. He writes this. In the world of the prayer book then, the individual Christian stands completely naked before God in a paradoxical setting of public intimacy. There are no powerful rites conducted by sacerdotal figures while the people stand some distance away, fingering prayer beads or gazing on images of the saints whose intercession they crave. Instead, the people gather in the church to speak to God and to be spoken to by him in soberly straightforward, though often very beautiful English. Again and again, they are reminded that there is but one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. None other matters, so none other is called upon. The one relevant fact is his verdict upon us, and it is by faith in him alone that we gain mercy at the time of judgment. All who stand in the church are naked before him together, exposed in public sight, and so they say, using the first person singular, but using it together, O oh God, make speed to save me, O oh Lord, make haste to help me. Um, and that's really what happens. We are, we are standing before God, very vulnerable, but we're doing it all together. Um, that's Kind of scary, but it's also really cool. We're all in the same boat. Okay. Yes, Nate. So, um, was the prayer book kind of an attempt by grammar to like, standardize like, the liturgy in the country? What, 
Why yeah. Why was, what was the point? Yeah. Um, let me see if I touch on that in this one. But um, that's that's a that's an excellent question. So further further recording, kind of what's the point um, of having a single prayer book? Um, and, you know, was it about standardization? That was a big part of it. So um, these goals in the preface about getting the scripture and having some easy to follow rules, that's the most important thing. But the other issue is let's do it all together as a country. Um, there was a variety of rights at that time. And, and that was really the case in all the world. Like everybody is standardizing their liturgy in the 16th century. Um, even when we think of like the, the, the Latin mass, it undergoes a major standardization and change in the Roman Catholic world about the same time. And, you know, liturgy nerds like me, we, it doesn't matter which tradition it is, you look back at that period of time like, yeah, this is when we did it right. Um, <laughs> you know, all, all of the chaos before, there's cool things, but it's chaotic. And then since then, all of the tinkering really hasn't been a good thing. <laughs> I mean, there might be occasional good things there, but in general, the tinkering hasn't been helpful. Um, so, yeah, that was a big part of it. We're all going to be on the same page. And what ends up happening is... Um, and as, as the Church of England expands with the British Empire in the next upcoming centuries, um, pretty much anywhere where English is spoken, everybody's praying the same. Because you don't have a whole lot of English-speaking Catholics going around the world. You have some, but not a whole lot. Um, and the other Protestants, with the exception of you know, people like the pilgrims and some of the stuff happening here in our country. Um, but even that's all post-colonial, right? Um, or not really post, you know what I'm saying. It's, it's not really part of the British Empire. Um, like when, when the Scandinavians or the Germans come, they basically tell their Lutheran people, go to the Anglicans, go to the Church of England people. Um, everybody's doing that. Um, and and the, 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 the main difference are homegrown English-speaking dissenters, you know, the Puritans of various sorts. Um, but yeah, wherever you go, and English is spoken, we're all pretty much doing it the same way. And even once it starts getting translated into other languages, um, as we do get to true post-colonialism, as the empire is falling apart, um, still we're all pretty much doing it the same way until about 50 years ago, when everybody starts changing everything and doing things willy-nilly. Um, very much against what the, all the bishops of the Anglican world gathering together wanted to do. Because we've never had, like, there's never been an Anglican pope, right? The Archbishop of Canterbury isn't in charge of the rest of us, and he never has been. Um, we've been a federation of churches that come from the same place historically, that all have bishops also, and use very similar liturgy. And, you know, we basically believe the same things historically. Um, but it was a federation, and so yeah, that so that standardization was a, was a major thing. Um, it gets revised very quickly at first, but kind of by the end of the English Civil War in the 1660s, it gets kind of set in stone and never really changes again officially um, in England. And among the daughter churches, we all start there, and then we kind of just adapt it lightly for our own own thing. Like you know, we don't have prayers for the king. That was why we did our own because we didn't have the king anymore, right? Um, so that, that kind of thing. So yeah, that standardization was, was very important, um, both for wherever you go, you're this, on the same page, but also more importantly, so that here locally, we're all on the same page. <coughs> yeah. And um, it's been observed that the prayer book um, does draw from an older monastic tradition. Now, to be historically accurate and fair um this is this is not this is this is what the reformers said this is not what i'm saying um the reformers did not like monasticism they thought it was a bad idea um and largely they thought that i mean there were some good reasons for thinking that there were some bad reasons for thinking that um on the good side it was they thought that creating kind of this professional religious class disenfranchised the rest of us that the regular folks didn't go to their prayers really because they had professionals praying for them. That was, the, that was kind of the main thing, and it created this. But all that said, where are we getting these prayer traditions from? They're developing in the monastery, right? 
So looking at the monasteries, there's some really important lessons that we can learn as we move forward, as we look at our rule of life as Anglicans. So first of all, we have this idea that monasticism starts as a way to combat corruption in cultural Christianity. What does that mean? Okay, Emperor Constantine converts. Um, he's not a bad guy, by the way, but he is a politician. And politicians be politicians. That's, that's just the way it is. Um, and with, with him converting, a bunch of the people did too, and, and there was probably a lot of people who didn't have a real sincere faith. I mean, it's not my place to say this is false profession or, you know, whatever, but there's a lot of people that aren't really walking the walk. They're just doing it because it's the, it's the culturally acceptable thing to do. Um, almost immediately is when we start to see monastic communities pop up. Why? Because it's a way to combat that corruption that happens in cultural Christianity. Now, it's good for a society to be Christian. It's way better to have a cultural Christian society than a pagan one. Paganism is bad for people. <laughs> um, even cultural Christianity is good on the earthly level. <laughs> but it does bring corruption, and so monasticism starts to do that, um, to fight the worldliness in the church and the problem that comes with politics in the church kind of intermingling when churches become established. Um, a very easy example in our own world today, the, the Church of England is still the established Church of England, and there's a lot of areas where they've been infected by the culture because of that. Like they don't want to stand up to the king or to the, to the forces of society because they are society, right? That's part of it. Maybe a little bit more nefarious, I have a good friend who's um, an Eastern Orthodox priest, and he was kind of telling me about some of the way things go with them. You know, they, they look at the, a lot of the Orthodox look at the Greek, the patriarch of the Greek church, the, the, the ecumenical patriarch, and say, you know what, he's a shill for the American government doing American things. A lot of the, you know, but at the same time, who's the alternative? It's the patriarch of Mount Moscow, who's very much a shill for the, for the government of Russia. Like, you know, these, these are very real forces. And I say, okay, what's the solution? He says, monasticism. I mean, the monks keep the religion from, from, from that, that impurity screwing everything up, right? So that's part of what monasticism does. Another thing it does, though, is it becomes an outpost in mission frontiers. A really good example of this is the kind of proto-monasteries that happen in the British Isles, particularly among the, the Welsh, the Scottish, um, and the Irish, the Celtic peoples. And what ends up happening in those, and this is according to um, an article on Western monasticism from the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia in 1911, which generally is pretty good on their history for the most part. Um, uh, a guy named Huddle Huddleston wrote this article. Um, he says that what it looks like was happening in the early days of the missionary works in the British Isles were that you ended up having these quasi-monastic communities, but what was different is that they were families, clergy, monks, everybody's living together. Everybody's setting up these intentional communities. Why are they doing this? Well, they're on the frontiers. They're gonna die, <laughs> you know? The, the pagans are gonna kill them. So they're doing this for defense, but they're also doing this for learning, and they end up growing this um, very interesting culture Christian culture that continues to spill over to this day in, in the way that we as the uh, people that come, whose, whose form of Christianity comes from that area, um, um, work together. But there are, all, there are some very important differences, so this is not, I'm not asking the parish to become a monastery. Um, you know, there, there's some vows <laughs> that, that, that happen in mon monasteries that we don't do here. Chastity, poverty, obedience. Um, those of y'all that have tons of money, that is not a sin. <laughs> Just do with it what you should, right? <laughs> um, you know, we, we are to be faithful, but we all don't have to be um, in, in terms of our, in terms of um, the way we practice sexuality only within marriage, but we're not all called to be single and celibate. Um, those specific vows of obedience, um, I am not the boss of you, I'm your pastor, I'm not, but I'm not your, your king, right? You know, I mean, that's, but in a monastery, yeah, your bishop or your, your, your abbot kind of is, you know, he is your boss. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you, owe, you owe obedience in, in a way that's not the same way in the laity. Like, matter of fact, within the, within 
the diocesan structures, y'all have more freedom than I do because I do have vows of obedience that y'all don't have. Um, so there are some things that you guys are free to talk about that I might not be able to, free to be talk about publicly, you know, for example. Um, so all that to say, empowering the lady, it's a good thing. Um, there's also different vocations. You know, we're, here most of us are in some form of, quote, regular life. We have families or we're um, in school or, you know, whatever. You know, even if, we're, even if we're single, we still have some sort of family connections. And, and there are certain vocations that go with that that are different from that very unique vocation of monasticism. And, and, and that vocational issue is why our reformers were not so keen on monasticism. They saw it as undermining the vocation of, of folks like, like y'all. Um, also, this is parish-based. Um, the focus of religion at the time of the Reformation in England switches from the monasteries, where everything really was happening over there, to the local parish. The, the life of prayer comes here, not out there. And that's, that's very important. The focus of prayer life moves to the parish church, and the cathedrals and the colleges are still kind of semi-monastic, but most of us are in regular parishes doing regular prayer. And then also, we're going to apply this differently in this family regular life. We're not having seven times a prayer a day. Um, I struggle to do it twice a day. You know, and, and, I, and I'm the professional. <laughs> you know, those of y'all, <laughs> those of y'all uh, go, going to, uh, to regular jobs and school and raising kids. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that monastic type of prayer is a little much, which is why the prayer book brings it down to two. Yeah, yeah, Nate? Yeah, so were there, like, monastic communities that continued through the Reformation? Because I was, from what I heard, they were either, like, abandoned or shut down or something So in England, they were abandoned or shut down. Um, and some of the reasoning for that, so, so yeah, the monastic orders were disbanded at the Reformation. Um, and that was very early on. Um, some of that was, whether this is true, true, or just the perception of the English government at the time, that you can argue about that historically. But the, from the perspective of the English government, the king and the privy council and the parliament, all that money that the monastic, the monasteries had were going to, for, to, to fund foreign enemies, i.e. the Pope, who wanted to uh, send war against England for leaving, right? I mean, that's, that's the way religion was done in those days. So that's part of it. So they, they took the money. Um, they stopped funding outside, and they did seize the money. But all of those communities, those monasteries didn't stop functioning. They just stopped functioning as monasteries. They became cathedrals, parishes. Uh, Westminster Abbey, where the king was crowned, um, an abbey is a monastery. That's, that's what it means. Um, and so instead of becoming an active monastery, it just becomes the big London cathedral. And most of those monks, it's not like they got kicked out. I mean, some of them might have left because they didn't want to move over. But most of them just became regular priests doing regular priest things. They became the choir, the priest choir at the cathedral instead of the monastic choir in the monastery. Most of them, that, that's what happens. So, I mean, the basic life continues. It just looks differently um, for the most part. Um, there are some folks that would quibble with some of those details, but that's kind of a big, big picture generalities, glittering generalities there. Um, and yeah, so it does look different in, in family. We do have in the back of our prayer book something interesting, which is a, an appendix called family prayer. Um, folks praying morning and evening prayer like we just did at home was not normal in the early days. Um, it's become normal. But in the early days, just, you know, different, you know, bishops or popular priests or authors would write their own set of family prayers for people to use at home. And what we have in the back here of ours are our, our forms of family to be used in prayers. These first two uh, morning and evening prayer, they're kind of adaptations of one of the more popular ones about the time of, um, about kind of that turn of the 18th to 19th century. These are the ones that, for the most part, Jane Austen's family would have used at home. And then, you know, the priests would, the pre the priest would go and have morning and evening prayer at the church, but it may, may, it may or may not have had people showing up. I mean... It was supposed to be so that people could, but, you know, who did? You know, maybe, maybe not. 
Um, but so we do have that kind of in an official capacity, capacity now. Okay, <coughs> one last thing on, on your handout, and then we'll just open it up for anything y'all want to talk about or, or dismiss. Um, I basically figured we'd go between half an hour to an hour on each of these sessions. Um, one of the uh, late 20th century books that's very influential when talking about um, kind of aesthetics, rule of life stuff in, in, uh, in an Anglican context is English Spirituality by a priest named Martin Thornton. And he describes the prayer book as having a threefold rule of life. The daily offices, weekly or, regu or more regular communion, and then everything else, the other devotions. And the other devotions might be the other stuff in the prayer book. It might be private study, private meditation. It might be some outside devotions. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. But um, so this is kind of the big overview of the kinds of things we're going to talk about over the next six weeks. Okay. Um, other questions? Any comments? Any discussion? Why was the book updated? Yes. So, was it, I guess you said it was for, I mean, obviously we're not going to pray for the queen. Yeah. So, in, in the American church, we have three editions that were kind of what we might say in the, in, the, in the classical pattern, the way that Archbishop Cramer set things up. And that was like 1793, 18, I don't know, 80-something, and then 1928. Um the first one was basically a very light adaptation of the English one. Um, they changed the state prayers. The way we do communion is a little bit different because it's influenced by some things going on in Scotland at the time, partially because they were the ones that gave us our first bishops. Um, back home in England, they didn't want to do it since we wouldn't uh, swear allegiance to the king, and they didn't think they could do bishops who didn't swear allegiance to the king. Um, by the time we got our second and third bishops, they had figured out how to do that, so everything was fine. But because of that Scottish connection, our communion liturgy is a little bit closer to the way they theoretically wanted to do it in Scotland. They, I don't think they ever actually did, but at least they wanted to do it that way. We were their guinea pigs since they couldn't do it at home. Um, and that was really it. Um, 18, the, the 18... 80, whatever. I don't remember what all they did. This one was a pretty radical for the time change. And the big thing that they were doing was making the church year a lot more important. So like if you open up to page three uh, in the prayer book, we have the beginning of morning prayer. And you'll see we've got these general, these general opening sentences. And if you read through them, they're all very much kind of, let's get into the right spirit of prayer type of thing. But then when you turn the page, we start, oh, here's something for Advent. Here's something for Christmas. Here's something for Epiphany, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that larger focus on the church year was pretty new um, in those days. And even having the opening sentences be more about prayer and worship than just like heavily penitential. That was pretty new at the time and pretty controversial at the time. Um, the core of everything that we have here is still very much what had been going on since just after the Reformation. Um, and the best things about it are the, are the old stuff. The worst things about it are 20th century. Um, the good news is that those best things were so much more than the worst things that it's still a really, really good, um, and, and, and as Americans, it's the one that's available to us in, for, from our tradition. The other ones are not in print anymore. But when they did the changes in the 70s, which were a total about face from everything historical at the time, it was, it was revolution, not evolution. This was, though this was a pretty big evolutionary step, it was still evolution. The ones in the 70s was absolute revolution liturgically, and they were doing it to change the doctrine of the church, and they did. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's part of the tools that they used to, to really, really liberalize the, the Episcopal church, um, was the prayer book. Um, 
But any, anyway, so that's, that's why we use that one here. This church has been around since before I was born, and it's been using this prayer book since then. Um, the reason why it's still in print is because there were enough people here in the American church that, that kind of rebelled against those changes that it was able to be kept in print. Um, the thing that is, again, just really terrible in this American 28 is that daily office lectionary, that reading plan for day to day. Um, because the readings are really short, and that means you can't get through, the whole, through most of the Bible if they're really short. And they skip around seasonally. So, you know, again, look, looking at this. Um, okay, we're, we're in the first Sunday of Advent. We're starting Isaiah, going through Isaiah. We stop um, just before Christmas. And we do just a hodgepodge of Old Testament things before Christmas. Um, in, the, in the New Testament, we start in Mark in the morning and we just stop so that we can talk about Luke 1 at Christmas time. It's understandable you want to do Luke 1 at Christmas time. I mean, that's understandable. But you've stopped off with Mark and you don't pick back up until like half a year later. Um, you know, and Isaiah is just scattered throughout. So this idea of really getting the Bible in a systematic way, you can't do it. Um, you know, I, I, one, one, of the, one of the guys in our, in our diocese, who they, they use this prayer book, he was telling us today that they give all the guys, that when they, the, the young people when they graduate, a printout of all the readings, just the actual readings, readings, not the, not the calendar, but the readings. I'm like, yeah, that's the only way that'll make sense is if you just print them out in the way they come and just pretend that the context within the Bible itself isn't there. And that's not what they're doing, but I mean, they're trying to make it something that they can follow better because you, because you can't, you skip around so much. It's, it's, it's a pain to follow. It, it totally undermines everything, the whole reason for the prayer book. Um, the reason why we haven't changed sooner to something else is because I've been looking at the options. And so I've come up, I, I've, I, I now know what I think is gonna be best for us. Or at least for me, and I'm making y'all do it too. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so and, and I'm, that's what I'm doing in my own my own stuff this year is kind of going through and seeing. Okay, yeah, this is indeed the way that we ought to go. Um, and the bishop agrees with me. So there we go. Uh, other stuff. All right. Well, then I will go ahead and uh, dismiss y'all. And um, next week, we're going to be looking at the offices themselves in a bit more detail. All right. God bless you all.